Thursday, July 2, 1863. All quiet on the Gettysburg front after the fierce fighting of the first day of battle, Wednesday, July 1. Soldiers had woken up. No thunder of guns, even no rattling of rifled muskets and repeating weapons. A soldier had picked up his fiddle and was playing Lurina, a song of longing for his beloved one far from here. What were the positions of both the Unionist Army of the Potomac and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia on this summer morning near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania? Through the night, reinforcements had arrived from both armies. Now, the Union Army had established a strong three-mile-long fishhook formation south of town. Its right flank was on wooded Culps Hill, southeast of Gettysburg. The line of defense bent to the west along Cemetery Hill, then continued to the south along Cemetery Ridge. Its left flank ended on Little Round Top. From this day on, Little Round Top would be the most well-known little hill in world the USA. This defensive position gave the Union Army of the Potomac, under the command of General George Meade, the advantage of the high ground. The fishhook gave the army convenient possibilities to reinforce lines quickly. The Confederate Army was solidly in control of Gettysburg, Oak Ridge and Seminary Ridge. What was Robert E. Lee's plan for this day, Thursday, July 2, 1863? Well, he wanted his General James Longstreet to bring his brigades south of Seminary Ridge and then bend to the east and the north to attack the Union positions via the Emmitsburg Road. Lee also ordered his General Ewell to start a simultaneous attack on the Union right at Culps Hill. As soon Ewell did hear Longstreet's attack in the south. Meanwhile, the Northern Army of the Potomac was waiting, waiting on the attack of Robert E. Lee. They waited for hours and hours. One of the Unionist generals, Daniel E. Sickles on the left flank of the Unionist line thought he would have a better position 1200 yards to the west, on slightly higher ground near a peach orchard along the Emmitsburg Road. But he had no authorization from General Meade. It was a dangerous move, because this move caused gaps in the Union defense line. Not until 4 p.m the Southern General Longstreet did start his attack. But he didn't expect to find the advanced 10,000 Unionist troops of Sickles within 600 yards of his own Confederate army. The army that wanted to move up along the Emmitsburg Road to the heart of the Union defense line. Therefore, Longstreet sent some of his brigades to the right to attack the Little Round Top, the uttermost left flank of the Union's defense line. On their way to Little Round Top, the Confederate brigades had to conquer Devil's Den. Devil's Den is a rocky area west of Little Round Top with a lot of enormous boulders. After changing hands three times, Devil's Den was finally taken by the Confederates. They held Devil's Den till their retreat on July 4 to Virginia. The lower part of the rocky slope between Devil's Den and Little Round Top is called the Slaughter Pen. We will show you why in a few minutes. On Little Round Top, at that moment, there was only a Unionist signpost. 
Just moments before the Confederate brigades attack Little Round Top, Brigade General Governor Warren found out this gap in the Unionist defense line and he immediately ordered reinforcements. Brigade General Vincent heard from Warren's messenger that the army desperately needed to defend Little Round Top. Then Vincent rushed his brigade to the hill, only minutes before the Confederates attacked. That Confederate attack was very intense and it came in several waves. Within a short time, the slope between Devil's Den and Little Round Top had been littered with fallen Confederates. It really became a slaughter pen. And on the top of the hill, also many Unionist troops perished. On that top, the troops of the Unionist Brigade General Joshua Chamberlain got low on ammunition. But Chamberlain was very determined to save the Unionist far left flank, so he ordered his troops to fix bayonets and to charge downhill. That charge of Chamberlain was a desperate one. But the Confederates were completely surprised by it. They thought the Union troops outnumbered them and they surrendered. And so the Unionists held their far left flank of the defense line. Then the Confederate troops pressed north and west into a wheat field. On that field the chest height wheat was ready for harvest. The wheat field changed hands six times in less than three hours. After those three hours the wheat field had become a bloody wheat field. Countless corpses were carped in the field. What about that unauthorized forward position of the Unionist Brigade General Sickles? Well, after General Longstreet had been recovered from his surprise to find Unionist troops so nearby, he had given orders to attack civil troops. And then there was a heavy fighting along Emmonsburg Road and at a beach orchard there. Sigel's unauthorized forward position didn't hold, despite reinforcements. The Confederate Mississippi Brigade broke the Union lines along the Emmonsburg Road. The Rose Farm at that road had been ruined. The fields near the Kodori farm at that road at the end of the day were covered with both Unionist and Confederate dead bodies. Between the Emmitsburg Road and the Unionist positions at Cemetery Ridge was only Captain John Bigelow's 9th Massachusetts Battery of the North near the Trussell farm. He was ordered to hold their position no matter the cost. And so the Trussell farm was home to unforeseen destruction. Their stand with six cannons gave the Unionist forces enough time to establish a secondary line between the Trussell farm and Cemetery Ridge. In the struggle, the attacking Confederate troops strategically shot the Union artillery horses to prevent them from maneuvering their cannons. Troops of the Confederate General Longstreet didn't succeed in conquering the Unionist line at Cemetery Ridge. Now we focus on the far right of the Unionist defense line. That morning the Confederate General Robert E. Lee had ordered his Brigade General Ewell to start a simultaneous attack on the Union right as soon as Ewell heard Longstreet attack in the south. And indeed, at about 4 p.m. Ewell's Confederate artillery opened the fire on Cemetery Hill, but not for long. Unionist artillery effectively silenced that Confederate attack. Hours later, 8 p.m., Ewell's infantry attacked the Unionist far-right defense line on Culp's Hill. The Confederates here captured the lower parts of Culp's Hill about 9 p.m., but Unionist reinforcements recaptured these lower parts soon. The Unionist press corps on Culp's Hill were defended by 1300 Unionist troops. Here on Culp's Hill and Stevens Knoll they managed to repel the many attacks from 4500 Confederate troops. 
At about 10 p.m. on July 2, the fighting ended. There was silence over the fields. No fiddles, no lorinas, even no bird songs. On the darkening battlefields you only heard the morning of wounded. The Battle of Gettysburg would continue the morning of the third day with a horrific bombardment and a massive Confederate attack on the heart of the Union's defense line. Gettysburg would still cost a lot more casualties. The end game was yet to come. <laughs>